much of my week trying to figure out the word to describe my inability to understand or enjoy the, the finer things in life, like food or poetry or art. The first word that came to my mind was uncultured, and so I Googled it. I'm like, oh, that's not quite it. And so I asked my wife. Uh, she suggested simpleton. Um, I'm like, it's definitely not that. My mom said ignoramus. I was like, what's happening here? So I went to chat GPT and it said that I was unrefined, just the boost of confidence that I needed to, to make it through this week. But I don't really have a palate for, for like fine food. If you put caviar in front of me, like I know where it's supposed to go, it's just not going to go there. You know, if you're talking about fine wine or fine coffee or luxury coffee, where you can like taste the hints of burnt caramel and orange, it's kind of like, okay. Uh, my sister is a world-renowned barista. She's won the Canadian Championships. She competes at the Worlds. And part of her job now is to travel around the world, uh, Singapore, Mexico, Brazil, to train their national champions to go to Worlds. So she knows what she's talking about. And so she made me a cup of coffee, and it made me long for my Costco brand Keurig pot. <laughs> it really did. Then there's art. I remember in high school, I went on a date with this girl who really liked art. And so... Uh, we went to an art gallery, and I didn't know what to do. Like, it was maybe one of my most awkward moments in my life. I didn't know what to do with my hands. I didn't, know, I didn't know what was happening. But everyone else seemed to know what was happening. And everyone stands like this when they look at a piece of art, for whatever reason. It's the art-looking position. And they're, com they're commentating on, like, what they're seeing. And I'm just sitting there and like, I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense to me. But then my daughter really started to get into art, my oldest one. And last year, when she was 11, she, she painted this picture. And for all you art critics, I realize this isn't fine art, okay? So chill, okay? Get off your high horse. But, but to me, I love it. I actually get emotional when I, when I see it. And the reason why is I can see kind of behind, I can see behind the art. You know, when I, when I see it, I see this girl who has found her place in the world. She's found how she can contribute. And that's been, that's been a journey. I see an outlet that God has given my daughter to go to um, when, when she's frustrated, doesn't know what to do. I know the, the source of this painting, why she did it. It was generated out of this deep place of love for one of her teachers. And so when I see this painting, there's just, there's just more than what meets the eye. I was looking at this painting a few weeks back during one of the messages, and I was brought into the painting a little bit. Um, now, it's kind of interesting information that this screen is 15 feet wide. Okay, I went with the tape measure last week and I measured it. <laughs> Everyone was asking me, what are you doing? And I was measured it, but the actual original painting is twice as wide as this. It's just over 29 feet. It's huge. And so you've probably seen this dozens of times, maybe hundreds of times, some sort of representation of this painting. And you just think, okay, that's, there it is. They're, they're having dinner. But if you're willing to kind of look beyond, there, there's, stuff, there's things going on that, that, that more than meets the eye. If you just concentrate on, on the 12 disciples, each one of these men have shed their lives to follow Jesus. This man who's like, unlike any other man they've ever known. His teaching is with authority. It's, it's revolutionary, but not in like this, you know, stick it to the man violence sort of way. It's upside down. Like, but it makes total sense. And it's permeated with this category, you know, breaking love that they've never seen before. And then there's all the signs and wonders that they would have seen. I mean, these guys would have walked by the same blind guy their whole life, and he's just the blind dude. He's always been blind. He'll always be blind. And then he meets Jesus, and a word is healed. Like, to see that with your own eyes, that would change you. These men were in a boat together, um, not 
not too long before this moment captured in this painting at the Last Supper. Fearing for their lives, at any moment uh, a, a wave could have crashed over their boat and sunk them all, and yet Jesus stands up and calms nature to a stillness with a word, the way that someone might rebuke a misbehaving dog. It's like they don't have framework for that sort of power. And then the miracle that would have been freshest in their mind as they're having this meal with Jesus was their friend Lazarus. He was dead. Jesus told him to be undead. And he was. He raised him from the dead. And these nobodies get to have a meal with him. It's crazy. Now there's lots more going on behind the scenes, but just focus on Jesus for a second. Because here's Jesus, and he knows what all these other guys don't know. He's carrying a burden that they don't even understand right now. For him, this is Jesus' very last supper, and he knows it. And so for him, he's saying goodbye to his friends. He's saying, before I go, this is what I really, really want you to know. Imagine you sitting around a dinner table with the people that matter most in your life, and you know that this is your last meal with them. What would you say? You know, whatever you ended up saying, you'd want every single word to count. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And so Jesus' last instructions to these 12 here are his lasting instructions to us today. Jesus at this supper is giving them and giving us clarity on what it means to follow him. But just because we know how to live the Christian life doesn't mean that it's easy. Because you can know something but still not be very good at it. I could tell you how to play hockey, but you would not want me on your team. Absolutely not want me on your team. And just so we have clarity on what it means to living like a Christian doesn't mean that it's easy. In fact, I'm going to argue that it's impossible. It's impossible to follow Jesus. It is just too hard. I don't care what you know. I don't care, you know, how self-disciplined you are. I don't care how good your intentions are. You cannot follow Jesus' commands on your own. It's just too hard. We've seen this over the last three weeks, just some of the really difficult, nearly impossible lasting instructions that Jesus has given these 12 men. In the first week, we learned about the posture of unrelenting forgiveness towards those who have hurt us. And I know for so many people, that is the hardest note to hit in Christian living. It's not just hard. It seems impossible to do. In the second week, we talked about uh, this distinguishing mark of a Jesus follower, which was to have a posture of love. Jesus said this. He said, love one another. As I have loved you, so you are to love one another. It's like loving people is hard enough, but notice Jesus doesn't say, hey, love them on your terms, according to how you want and when you want and, you know, according to their behavior. That's how we naturally love people. No, Jesus says, as I have loved you, so love one another. We are to love others with this irrationally generous, self-sacrificing love. And that's hard to do. On our best day, you know, maybe if the Oilers won the night before and it's payday and you got eight hours of sleep, you know, and you got a Costco Keurig, you know, coffee in the morning, maybe you can attempt it. But to keep that up day after day, to love other people like Jesus, good luck with that. That is so hard to do. Then last week, we talked about having this posture of trust that regardless of what's going on in your life, and I know, I know that people are walking through pain, that people are walking through hard times. Yet despite that, to live with this trust in the faithfulness of Jesus is so hard because worry is natural. It dominates our life. How are you supposed to do all of those things and more? Is it just a matter of self-discipline? Is it just a matter of trying really hard? We know that that's part of it, but it can't be all of it. It can't be all of it. Because despite our best intentions, despite our best measures of discipline, it's like we fail time and time again. And what happens in your spirit when you fail at something over and over again? Sometimes you just want to give up. But you just feel like a failure. You feel insecure. You lack confidence. And there's so many people who live out their Christian life insecure, feeling like a failure, having no confidence. And here's the compounding problem, is that Jesus in John 14, where we're going to be spending our time today, 
he says these words, and it can feel like at times like a knife to the heart. He says, if you love me, keep my commands. Now, it's simple. If you love me, keep my commands. And this makes sense. I love my wife. And one of the ways that I display that is when she asks me to do something, I do it. Even if I don't really want to do it, I do it. And vice versa. And it's not because we're in a power struggle with one another. It's not because we're trying to dominate one another. But it's because when you love somebody, you serve them. And when you stop serving them, it's a real clear sign that you have stopped loving them. So for me to ignore my wife's commands and what she asks of me would be a sign of apathy, which is the exact opposite posture of love. So Jesus, in saying this, it's not some legalistic command. It's the heart of a loving relationship. We serve Jesus because we love Jesus. But if keeping Jesus' commands is so hard to do, it's like, what are we supposed to do? Unless we have help, we're in a lot of trouble. And so with that in mind, we're going to go to John chapter 14, verse 15. And Jesus says this. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you. The promise here that Jesus gives us, which is comforting, is that we don't have to follow him alone. We don't have to try to keep his commandments just through our own willpower. Jesus says he's going to send us a helper, which he also calls the spirit of truth. And a relationship with this spirit of truth, with this helper, is that he's going to be with us forever. He's going to dwell in us, with and in. Then Jesus says these fascinating words next in verse 18. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. Remember, this is his farewell discourse. Jesus knows in this painting, I'm leaving. So he says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. He says, I'm not going to leave you without the presence of that of a loving parent. I'm not going to leave you like that. I'm going to come to you, which is wonderful. But it's like, well, what is it? Are you going or are you coming? Well, he's going. But the helper Jesus is sending represents Jesus to the point that Jesus refers to the helper in first person. He goes, I will come to you even though I am going. So clearly this helper that Jesus is sending is not some part-time spiritual you know, aid that Jesus you know, sends us just to get us out of a tough spot, a jam. No, it's something much, much more than that. So it's like, well, who is he? He answers this a few verses later in verse 25. He says, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So the helper is the Holy Spirit. Have you ever thought that it would be way easier to follow Jesus if you could do it in the same way the disciples did with Jesus in the flesh, like right here? Like you ain't doing anything naughty if Jesus is right here, <laughs> right? If I got my phone here and, and my mom's calling me and I got Jesus right here, I'm picking up the phone every time, right? <laughs> it feels easy. Like it, I would be able to follow Jesus if, I, if he was right here in the flesh like the disciples did, to see him face to face the way that the disciples did. you got to witness the miracles firsthand. I mean, if you saw a dead person raised or a storm calmed, caused, uh, calmed with a word, like that would just produce this unshakable, life-lasting faith in you. I mean, I know that it didn't really work out that well for Judas, and, and Peter too sort of denied, and actually all the disciples kind of abandoned Jesus in his most needed moment. But I wouldn't, right? It would, it would work in me. <laughs> but logically, it seems like that, right? It would be a lot easier to follow Jesus if he was right here in the flesh, but Jesus didn't seem to think so. Two chapters later, in the same Last Supper discourse, referring to the helper, Jesus says this. He says, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Why? For if I do not go away, the helper, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Just saying it's better for us that he sends the helper, the Holy Spirit, than him being right here beside us in the flesh. So how could that be? How could that be true? 
Jesus could only be in one place at one time with one group of believers, but the Holy Spirit can be with all people at all times, everywhere. The promise is that he will be with you forever and he will dwell in you. So who is the Holy Spirit? The clearest way to think of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit is God's personal presence. The Holy Spirit is God's personal presence. Romans 5, 5 says this. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Who has been given to us? The way that we experience God's love is through the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is God's personal, loving presence. And the word personal is important. We can't forget that. The Holy Spirit is not a force. The Holy Spirit is not impersonal. The Holy Spirit relates to us like a person. He guides us, convicts us, comforts us, teaches us. Scripture tells us that we can grieve the Holy Spirit. We can lie to the Holy Spirit. We can sin against the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is a person, but not in the way that we often think about persons. Instead, Scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit is God, like Jesus is God, and the Father is God. This is the Christian doctrine called the Trinity, which states we worship one God who eternally exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this is the great mystery of God. And this is also a great stumbling block for so many because the math doesn't really add up. We have to understand that God is other. He's not like you. He's not like you. He is infinitely greater than we are. And so we don't really have a framework to process this. And so we have to give up on the pipe dream of being able to know God exhaustively, but you can know him accurately. And he has chosen to reveal himself as one God eternally existing in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the personal presence of God. And so when you sense God's presence, like you did in worship, that's the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a lot more that we can talk about here, but the question for today is how does the Holy Spirit help us keep Jesus' commands. You know, we've established how hard, even impossible, doing that is. And Jesus also recognizes that reality, saying, I'm going to send you someone to help you do that. So how does the helper help? I'm going to read verse 16 again. It says this, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, another helper, to be with you forever. The Greek word for helper is parakletos. That could be, word could be broken down into two separate words, para and kletos. Para means beside. Kletos means telling you the truth. So the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, is the one who stands beside you constantly telling you the truth. That sounds like a really good friend. It's tough to translate this word parakletos into English, and so different Bibles will translate in different ways. You might have helper. You might have comforter. You might have counselor here. Sometimes they give up and just say paraclete, and then you're like, what does that mean? Oftentimes, most oftentimes, the Bible actually, translators will translate it as advocate. And I'm going to advocate that that is the best way to translate it. Advocate. An advocate is a representative. It's a substitute. An advocate stands in the place of a powerful person and represents them. Now, the most obvious image that we might have of that is that of a lawyer who stands in behalf of his client before the judge and speaks on his behalf. So this is the advocate idea. But remember, Jesus said that there is, uh, he is sending another advocate. He's sending another advocate. If the Holy Spirit is the other advocate, who's the first advocate? John tells us this as well. He says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, so that you will keep Jesus' commands, because that's how we show him that we love him. I write this to you that you will not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Jesus is our advocate. So here's how it works. We do not want to sin because it's the way that we display our love for Jesus. So we don't want to screw that up. But we do screw that up. And when we screw that up, Jesus comes and is our great defender. He is our advocate. New Testament says this, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for the things while done in the body here on earth, whether good or bad. There are eternal consequences to the way that you live your life. And one day we will appear before the great judge to give an account of our life, how you spent your days, 
how you handled your relationships, how you spent your money, how you served and loved his church. We'll give an account for our life. There are some people listening who might not believe that. You don't believe that there's going to be some eternal consequence for the way you live your life. There's no great judge. There's just dirt. That's it. You live, you die, you're done. It is unconscious darkness from there on out. It's like, well, what if you're wrong? What if you're wrong? And my guess is you want to be wrong. You do not want to be right about that. You want there to be eternal consequences to people's lives. Because that way, people will get what's coming to them. And we love that. Is there a better thing than when someone gets what's coming to them? And there's a worse thing when someone gets off the hook. If you're driving and there is a maniac driving and a few blocks later you see him get pulled over, is there any better feeling than that? That is 10 out of 10. There's like Skittles, there's sex, and there's people getting pulled over by the police. Like it's the best. This is what we want. We want people to have to give an account for their actions, for their life. We want other people to have to give an account for their actions in their life, not for us. So that idea of giving an account for your life before God can be terrifying. And it is terrifying. And if you had to do it yourself, you should be terrified. I wouldn't want to advocate for myself. The problem is here on earth for so many Christians, you're trying to advocate for yourself. You're trying to defend yourself to God. God, look at me. Why aren't you doing this for me? Do you see my life? Don't, don't you see how good I am? How I treat the poor? How I treat the people around me? I'm so much better than this person and that person. We try to advocate for ourselves. It's like, well, what would God say to you at the end? It's like, yeah, but I told you to forgive. That was like, that was like real important. And you lived your life with such unforgiveness towards your parents. What about that? What about that lust that dominated your heart? What about the apathy that you extended towards the poor? What about all the people that you lied to? It's like, I don't want to advocate on my own. I don't want to stand before an all-holy God and have to defend myself. The wonderful news is when you put your faith in Jesus, he becomes your great defender, your advocate. And as your advocate, this is important, Jesus isn't advocating before the Father for mercy for you. He's not standing before the Father and says, here's Ken. He, was, he wasn't the best Christian. I know that. He failed a lot, but would you pretty please give him another chance? Please. That's not what's happening in that relationship as Jesus is advocating for you. He's not asking for mercy for you. Instead, Jesus stands before the throne room of the Father, and he demands justice for you. He says, here's Ken. Has he lied a lot? Yeah. Has he lived a selfish life? Yes. Did he love people the way that he could have? No. But all of that has already been paid for. Father, your law states that that debt had to be paid through blood. And I already paid that for him. And it would be unjust of you to take two payments for that debt. So I stand before you, Father, and I don't ask for mercy. I ask for justice. Jesus is your great defender. He is your advocate. So if that's the first advocate, what about this other advocate? What does he do? Verse 26 says this. But the helper, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. Theologian J.I. Packer, he describes the Holy Spirit as the floodlight on Christ. See, a floodlight properly placed, it doesn't draw attention to itself, but it makes visible what otherwise would be invisible. In other words, the Holy Spirit is constantly revealing Jesus to us when we fail to see him. The Holy Spirit is never saying, look at me, listen to me, focus on me. The Holy Spirit is always saying, look at Jesus, listen to Jesus, focus on Jesus. And so the Holy Spirit is constantly helping reorient your life to Christ. He is beside you, telling you the truth about reality and about Jesus. And so if you're living in a state of bitterness and unforgiveness, 
The Holy Spirit comes like a friend who loves you, but he'll give you tough love. He'll, he'll hit you in the side. He'll, how could you be living with unforgiveness? He says, look, I'm putting a floodlight on Jesus. Look at the forgiveness he's given you. Look at the cross. And it's only when our eyes are on Christ that the impossible task of forgiveness becomes possible. That's how he helps us. When we're acting in apathy or indifference or a lack of love towards someone else, the Holy Spirit puts a floodlight on Christ and he just puts you on the side. He says, hey, remember Jesus' love? Remember his words, what he said? As I have loved you, so love one another. And it's only when we remember the unconditional love of Jesus that the impossible task of loving others like Jesus can become possible. And when you're walking through life and the weight of things is just so heavy and you are just burdened and you are worried, the Holy Spirit will come alongside you, shine this floodlight on Christ and remind you of his words. Don't let your heart be troubled, but trust God. The helper reminds us of the cross and reminds us of the resurrection and says to us, you think that Jesus is going to go through all of this just to forget about you? You can trust him. It's only when we're reminded of the faithfulness of God that the impossible task of trusting God and living free of worry becomes possible. The Holy Spirit, our helper, makes the impossible task of following Jesus' commands possible by shining a floodlight on Christ, reminding us of all that he said and all that he did. And this should give you a posture of confidence. Confidence that you're not alone, that you're loved that you don't have to advocate for yourself. Jesus is doing that for you. Confidence that you can follow him because you have a helper who is reorientating your life to Christ all the time. Shining a floodlight on the good works, on the good words of Jesus. You can't follow Jesus' commands on your own, but you can if you have help. So the question for today is this. How is the Holy Spirit trying to help you? How's the Holy Spirit trying to help you? Where is he reminding you of Jesus' words and and shining a light on Jesus' life? It's only when our eyes are on Christ and not our own pain we can forgive. It's only when our minds are set on the cross that we can live with love. It's only when our heart is set on the faithfulness of Jesus and not our own troubles and not our own pain that we can live with a posture of trust. We have this gift in the Holy Spirit to help us keep Jesus' commands by constantly reorienting your life to Christ. So how is the Holy Spirit helping you keep Jesus' commands today? My encouragement is to not resist him, to not ignore him, and don't drown him out. Instead, give in. He's a friend beside you telling you the truth. Receive his help today. Let's pray. Jesus, we're thankful that you did not leave us as orphans, but you sent us help. You gave us the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. Through him, we can experience your love, and I pray that each person in here and each person online, that they would experience your love through the Holy Spirit today. Would you pour that into their hearts? God, we thank you that we do not have to follow you alone that this Christian life is not just willpower. It's not just discipline, but it's more than that. You have given us someone to help us by reminding us of your life, by reminding us of your words. And so I pray that each person here would have a floodlight in their heart shining on Christ right now. For whatever difficulty they're walking with, walking through, that God, you would help them see Jesus in that. That you'd bring to mind the words that they've read in your Holy Scripture. You'd bring to mind the life of Jesus, the posture of Jesus, so that they can face the troubles they're facing today with faithfulness to you. God, I pray that we would be a church filled with the Holy Spirit, who yields to the Holy Spirit, who remembers your words constantly, and we forgive, and we love, and we trust you. I pray this in your wonderful name. Amen. Today, if you do not know the first advocate, if you don't know Jesus, and you want to know Jesus. Because listen, we don't pray to the Holy Spirit to get the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a free gift when we come to Jesus. He sends it. 
And so we pray to Jesus and we ask Jesus to be the Lord and leader of our life. And what happens, he gives you the Holy Spirit to be with you and in you forever. And if you want to know Jesus so that you can have him as your first advocate and the Holy Spirit as your other advocate, we want to help you do that today. The easiest way to do that if you're online or if you're in the building here is to scan the QR code on the seat back in front of you or on the screen. That's just going to give you your next step on what it looks like to follow Jesus. If you'd like to talk to someone, we're going to have some um, pastors here at the front who would love to pray with you and answer some of your questions. But if you'd like prayer for anything, we'd love to pray with you as well. Thank you so much for being in church today, and we'll see you next week. Amen.